On the 26th of January 1569, Mary Queen of Scots must have come to the realisation that she was no longer a guest in England, but a prisoner. But did she ever really have the opportunity to escape? Because she had escaped from prison in Scotland. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Behind me is Tutbury Castle in Staffordshire. Now on the 4th of February 1569, a much more famous person than me went through the gates there. She came with 60 attendants, one of them our jailer. You see, nine days earlier, she had left Bolton Castle after an inconclusive commission looking at her husband's death. Now, I say inconclusive, nonsense would be a better word. The commission had been arranged by Elizabeth of England, but Mary had committed no crime in England. I'll be honest, we haven't committed any crime in England either, but we've been barred from going into that castle. You see, they're having a photography day here at Tutbury Castle today and I thought that was a fantastic opportunity for us to do this film. I phoned up, I checked it'd be okay to come and make my video for YouTube. They said, oh, we'll need to check. Stuart, the guy you had to contact said, he went away and he checked and he came back after a couple of days and said, yes, that won't be any problem. In fact, there's going to be somebody dressed up as Mary Queen of Scots. That'll be perfect for you. I said that will. It'll be fantastic. I'll go online and pay the £45 that you require. Not a problem, he said. I went on. I paid my money. We arrived here. We went in and uh, on the as we went in, uh, a lassie, Leslie, I can't remember her surname, the, Leslie Smith, I believe, is the creator. Oh, are you filming for broadcast? No, it's a YouTube channel, I said. Oh, that's not a problem, she said, and drove off. However, once we started filming, 10 minutes later, security came up and said that that very woman who'd said everything was fine had phoned to tell him to get us off the premises. I explained that I'd pre-approved everything, that I'd checked that in fact Mary Queen of Scots would be waiting for me. But no, we were huckled off the property. Jocks in town were just too much of a problem, I assume. Now, the good thing is the Earl of Shrewsbury had nine properties round and about in the Midlands of England seven of which Mary Queen of Scots was held in prison. Now I need to find another one of those to try and finish off this video. I tell you this, I'll never, ever, ever come back to Tutbury Castle. And if you're anything like me, you'll do the same. I'm not entirely sure they're trustworthy from my experience. It's pretty unlikely that Mary had committed the crime that she was accused of in Scotland. She'd arrived in England as an asylum seeker. The whole thing was a sham, but she arrived here to be delivered into the custody of the sixth Earl of Shrewsbury. He'd only recently married Bess of Hardwick, who'd built the original Chatsworth house here, and whose own tale in connection with the Stuart dynasty, that's for another day. But her husband was chosen as jailer for Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, there are four reasons Elizabeth chose the Earl of Shrewsbury as Mary's jailer. One, she knew him to be loyal. Two, she knew he was a Protestant, which was a reason in itself for loyalty. Three, he had wealth and a number of properties in which he could hold Mary and her entourage and all in the fashion appropriate to a queen. I said he had nine properties, and this was just one of them. Fourth, and most importantly, those properties were in the middle of England, the optimum place to be as far from the Scottish border at the same time as being far from London, and as far from the coast as possible. Elizabeth had no intention of letting her hostage go anywhere. Mary had arrived in England in May 1568 and spent nine months 
thinking that this would be a short stay. She'd be heading back to Scotland to be queen, or at worst, to France, to live out the life in the comfort and liberty of royal exile. But those nine months turned into 19 years of imprisonment. Mary's Bower here at Chatswell was one of our favourite places and our last chance to escape wasn't far away. But if Mary had been hoodwinked in expecting a shorter sojourn, so had her jailer, the Earl of Shrewsbury. When he was given custody of this queen, he couldn't have known the responsibility would break him, his marriage and his fortune. Shrewsbury was under the impression that he was doing a short-term favour for his queen before permanent arrangements were made for Mary. Now, don't get me wrong, he had his reservations. In one letter before she arrived, Shrewsbury wrote saying, The Queen of Scots coming to my charge will make me soon grey-headed. I'm thinking his fear of being a jailer wasn't that the job would bring long, gruelling, resource-draining years without end. Maybe more that he might be a target for those who supported Mary. Imagine, for example, you're in today's USA and it was decided that Donald Trump should be imprisoned for his shenanigans. Maybe, like Mary, there's not enough proof for conviction. Either way, he's had his hands on too many military secrets to be let loose in the world. So, as a wealthy noble, the deep state asks you to look after him in the manner that he's become accustomed. Make fun of Trump, mention a deep state. Rangers, Celtic, Independence, Union, fight it out amongst yourselves. The point is that you might think that this new responsibility would cost a few quid, but a more immediate question would be, when will the mob be at my door? The situation for Shrewsbury wasn't a million miles from that. Elizabeth stated, we are keeping the Scots Queen in custody, but in the manner of a queen. That's going to cost a few quid. We've already mentioned the size of the entourage, but whilst Elizabeth gave the Earl Shrewsbury the responsibility of keeping Mary, she never came up with the necessary funding. In David Templeman's book, Mary Queen of Scots, The Captive Queen in England, he tells how Mary's meals would have 16 courses, with her entourage enjoying 10 courses. This would prove to be a huge drain on one of England's wealthiest noblemen. At least Trump only ate hamburgers. But worst of all, the Earl himself was equally sentenced without charge to indefinite imprisonment. You see, to make sure that Mary wasn't allowed to escape, the Earl had to stay with her. No fortnight in Magaluf for him. When the Lairds went hunting, shooting and fishing in the Highlands, he'd be stuck firmly to his charge. When his wife said, Darling, what about that weekend in Paris you promised? Early boy would have to decline. They say the strain eventually contributed to the estrangement of the Earl and his recently betrothed wife, Bess of Hardwick. There were more prosaic strains as well. Now, I've decided Tutbury isn't worth visiting, but even back then, Tutbury was a partly decayed old stately home, surrounded by marshland that needed renovation, had no drains to the privies, and according to Mary, left the kind of smell you'd expect beneath her window. Not conducive to good health. In fact, Mary fell ill, which prompted a move to one of Shrewsbury's other properties. Wingfield Manor was much nicer. Mary had a suite of apartments looked out on an orchard back here. Maybe a wee shimmy doing a tree will get her away. No, it was still well guarded, but an opportunity for escape would present itself. Just three weeks after they arrived here at Wingfield Manor, Mary fell ill again. This time so ill that the rumour in London was that she was dead. And at Wingfield Manor, they administered her last rites. You can imagine 
that when she recovered, Shrewsbury wanted her to be in the healthiest place he had available. And he took her to Chatsworth House, 15 miles to the north, for a week's recuperation before bringing her back here to Wingfield. Now here's a bit of intrigue. The day before she left for Chatsworth, she'd signed a marriage commitment to a guy called the Duke of Norfolk. If you watched my video about when Mary finally realised she was in an English prison in the first place, then you'll know that not long after she'd arrived in England, before she realised she was a house prisoner, she'd met the Duke of Norfolk in Carlisle. Since then, they'd become as close to amorous as house arrest in Elizabethan times would allow. He'd lent her money and support, and now they'd drawn up a marriage agreement. Anyway, Mary signs that, sends it off, and the next day she's whisked off for that week's holiday at Chatsworth for the sake of her health. On the journey back to Wingfield, Shrewsbury himself caught a chill, which turned into a fever. Oh, dearie, dearie me, they're dropping like flies. Now, Elizabeth in London would no more have wanted her jailer to die in her than her prisoner, and she sent get well wishes, and he sent a note back to say thanks. But along the way, Shrewsbury's wife, Bess of Hardwick, who'd already lost three husbands, clearly thought a fourth would look suspicious. An already arthritic, gout-ridden man, recovering from fever, but with the ongoing stresses of looking after the troublesome Queen of the North, was not the picture of longevity. So, Bess sends off to London for permission to take him to their home in Buxton. Now, if you've never been there, it's a lovely spa town and would certainly be good for his health. But after a month without reply, Bess thinks, sod it, I'm taking him anyway. Now here's an opportunity for Mary. Jailer gone, taking some of the entourage with him. Security's diminished. Time to open up Charlie Trench. There was already a plan in place that had been conceived by Leonard Dacre. He was a Roman Catholic cousin of Shrewsbury who'd been to the castle to meet Mary. He'd arranged that if she would change dresses with one of our ladies in waiting, then he would arrange with his collaborators and the domestic staff to get her outside the castle where horses would be waiting. And with the help of Earl of Northumbria and other accomplices, they'd whisk her off to safety. The plan was already in place, but now was the perfect opportunity for execution. The plan was infallible and had the support of key players inside and outside of the castle. Mary had now been cooped up for a year and was under no illusion that she was now in prison. There was no time to hesitate. Mary hesitated. She had only just agreed to a betrothal to the Duke of Norfolk. She couldn't escape without his agreement. Norfolk responded that he could by no means approve of any practice for her escape. Of course he couldn't. A Mary in France wouldn't advance his ambitions. To be fair, a Mary in France might not advance her own ambitions, but she would be free. In her life, Mary had made three progressively more disastrous marriages. The second and the third were her own choice. With hindsight, you can trace a line through each one of them to her present predicament. Maybe her worst decision of all was to follow the instructions of a man that she never even got round to formally marrying. Mary let the opportunity to escape pass her by. This wasn't the last scheme for Mary to escape, but none would present quite the opportunity that this one had. Or would it? Her schemes in the future would become more and more desperate and her confinement more and more tightly controlled. Both Mary and her fiancé, the Duke of Norfolk, would end up losing their heads. Him long before her. 
When Shrewsbury returned from Buxton, he was reprimanded by Elizabeth and warned never to leave his charge again. Imprisonment would continue for both of them. If you want to know more about Mary Queen of Scots and the decisions that changed her life, then there's another video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, Doc is going to be a lamb alley. Cheerio and Rasta.